For a good while now, we've been studying the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. And I want to begin with a text from there. Isaiah chapter 57, verses 20 and 21. Isaiah 57, 20 and 21. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, for the wicked. These people are described in the New Testament by the inspired apostle Peter when he wrote, uttering great swelling words of vanity. Then he goes ahead to say, promising them liberty while they themselves are bond servants of corruption. 2 Peter 2, 18 and 19. It may seem that worldly wicked people are at peace, but they are not. When you look at the Hollywood types, the entertainment industry, the political types, the very wealthy who have sold all they had to obtain what they've got, no matter what they did to other people, they're simply not happy. Well, they appear to be, well, as I said uh, many times, and you've heard it said of others, uh, appearances certainly can be deceiving. Remember, all these people that you see being so worldly have a spirit formed in, God, in them by God. They, eternity has been set in their heart. So what have they done to themselves? Well, first of all, they've committed spiritual suicide because, number one, you know they're not honest. Luke 8, 15. They've aligned their lives with the affairs of this present world and the God of this world they serve. And the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of pride of life have dominated their life. And they live strictly for the sensual of this world. They may make claims of happiness or security, peace, but the wicked do not have real peace. I have a quote that I keep on the bulletin board at home. I found it in a book. And this man in 1900, thereabouts, great cattleman of North Texas, was dying had a terminal disease. And he said, I'm worth a million dollars. Now think of how much that would be today in our currency. I'm worth a million dollars and none of it can do me any good. And that's the way it is for people who live for the flesh. And we who have chosen to follow Christ in love and obedience to the truth need to understand that about all the people around about us who are outside of Christ and lost in sin. Now there are those who upon hearing the gospel will change their ways. But for those who live solely for this world, they are the troubled sea. In Mark 6 verse 34, our Lord evidence is the compassion that he only could do for those lost in sin. Scripture says he came forth and saw a great multitude and he had compassion on them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. It may help us in our godliness to understand why Christ, the Savior of the world, the great physician, would look out over all those people. They didn't have proper direction. They didn't have somebody leading them in the right way. Many of them would hear the gospel later on and they wouldn't obey it. But nevertheless, the truth would be provided for them. One of the signs in your life and my life as a Christian is when you can look at very wicked people and not just be upset at their wickedness and the terrible evil they do to others, but to realize what's going to happen to that person. And they do deserve compassion, even when we deal with them and refute the errors of their life. 
So when people turn from God to live in sin, they are then like the troubled sea in so many respects. The wicked have no compass for direction. Daddy in becoming a part of the armed forces before World War II actually, of course they taught them how to read a compass. And we would go hunting sometimes at night and there wouldn't be a star available to see, no moon out either. And Daddy had a little compass he always had with him and as we stood by the car, he would hold it and he'd get his directions. We'd take off. And as long as he stayed true to that compass, it didn't make a difference where we went, he always got back to the car. That didn't mean sometimes he didn't get lost, but it wasn't because he followed the compass properly that he got lost. And we must needs have a compass, a spiritual compass, that we don't stay lost and turn into a trouble sea also. We need direction for our lives. I think one of the biggest fools there is is the person who says, I don't need anybody to direct me, or else goes to the wrong person for direction. And without God, we do not have the perfect one to give us direction. In Genesis 1, verse 26, Moses wrote, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Well, I've studied that over the years, and I, I understand it partially. But I wish I could understand or actually plumb its depths of what does that mean about my spirit fathered by God. Understand some of it. Don't know that I understand all of it. But I know it means I will never cease to exist. I know it means that once I leave this body, I will still exist as a center of personality. And I must exist when all is said and done in this earth and all of its system of things is gone, either in heaven or hell. And I have this time period to demonstrate to God that I love him supremely and that I will have faith in him based upon his word and nothing else. So what is my purpose in the flesh on earth? Well, Acts 17, 27 reads, as Paul preached to those philosophers and others on Mars Hill and the Acropolis in Athens, that they should seek God. And then we learn also, as we've quoted most often from, often from Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, chapter 12 and verse 13, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now when all is said and done, it's all summed up, there it is. That's the purpose of your life and my life. That may be involving, of course, a number of particulars. But that's what it comes down to. Fear God and keep his commandments. And we're here to seek God and know his will. And Paul, when he had to say in that sermon, he is not far from any one of us. In other words, he wants us to find him and he wants to be found. A mariner would be in deep trouble trying to sail across the sea without a compass. And of course, mankind is in trouble when we reject God as the one to give us the proper direction as we go through life. Again, we say the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps, Jeremiah 10, 23. Going back to the beginning, we see that when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, God drove him out of the garden and he was separated from God and he drove him out from a relationship that he had with him before sin came to his life. It just simply points out God's not going to abide where sin is. The scripture reads in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. It didn't say he couldn't hear. It does not say 
that he couldn't do this or couldn't do that, but it says he will not. Why? Because we've sinned. All of us have sinned, Romans 3, 23. And in studying John, we've seen how John has talked about that. But we also see from John in the Gospel of John, John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Would you give your Son for the way this nation primarily is today if it would save all of them? He died for us according to Hebrews 2, verse 9. He therefore has made salvation from sin, the hope of eternal life in heaven, available to everybody. Of this it is said in several places in the book of Romans. We'll begin in Romans 3.25. And then we'll jump over to chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And chapter 6, verse 3. Whom God set forth, this is Christ, to be a propitiation. Remember our study of propitiation from the book of John? On Wednesday night. He's the one who appeased God. God in the flesh appeased God. Concerning the wrath we truly deserve because we chose to leave God by sinning against Him. So Christ, He says, is the propitiation through faith on our part in His blood, the blood He shed on Calvary's cross. Then we go on and see much more than being now justified by His blood, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Thus we see the latter verse, we who were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death. Being thus cleansed from our past sins, we're now on the road, and we need a compass. We had to have a compass, really, to get us to the point of becoming children of God, and we must continue on with the compass pertaining to living the Christian life. We have to have direction, proper direction, supplied for our lives. Left alone, we simply don't know what to do. Left alone, we become one of the wicked. One of those like the troubled sea. Really, we become like most of those that we are associated with every day all the way around us without God in the world. I said earlier that the wicked are not at peace. The wicked have no peaceful haven. You think about sailors who are involved in storms at sea. And they, nor the ships they are in, can handle what storms they're in. Now back in the days of sailing ships, but it's still true today, they would seek a harbor that would shelter them from the storms, a peaceful haven. The one thing we have to do is realize that sin invariably brings trouble to your life. That's it. We need to be sounding out as members of the church the haven, the only haven, the gospel and what it offers for those in sin. Now that doesn't mean everybody's going to listen. It means that some people will start and stop. You don't know the hearts of other people. You cannot tell how they're approaching things. Nevertheless, that doesn't stop us from leaving God in lies before them and for teaching the truth to them. Isaiah 9 and 6 talked about Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Well, that just simply says true, genuine peace can only come through Jesus Christ. Paul said this in the New Testament, He is our peace. And he said that with this in mind because the Jews were separated from the Gentiles by the law of Moses, by what it required of them. But he said, having abolished in his flesh the enmity or the hate, so making peace. Ephesians 2, 14, 15. When Christ died, he, the law of Moses, the ordinances that were against us, contrary to us, was nailed to the cross. 
Colossians 2.14. And he told his apostles, Peace I leave with thee. My peace I give unto you. John 14.27. How much trust, how much faith, how much confidence, how much belief do you have in the truths of the Word of God? You can read them and intellectually understand them, but do you really trust them and entrust yourself to them? Because if you don't, then you can intellectually grasp it, but it doesn't mean you really trust things. Remember, the devils believe and tremble, but they're not saved. And we can fall into that same boat. After all, James was written to members of the church. Christ and his gospel are to provide for us the security and the peace that all men crave. Again, in the Ephesian letter, the Apostle Paul writing to brethren there in Ephesus said that we may be no longer children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Then he went ahead to say, but speaking truth in love may grow up in all things in him who is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love means speaking the truth in love of the souls that need it, in the love of God who provided it, and in the love of the truth that demands we love it. It's not just aimed at the souls we speak to, but we must love that truth we preach and have great confidence in it that God will see us through. No more trouble see. No more trouble see when we put our trust in Him and live in Him as His Word guides us. Now, is that saying that you won't run against problems and have problems? No, no. Paul was his greatest servant of Jesus Christ as has been. But he'll also give you a list of all the troubles and problems he went through. How could he write about this then? Because they were insignificant. They're just passing. He's moving on through this life to greater things. I listened to a man the other day who has two PhDs from recognized very important universities as far as academia is concerned. And on the second PhD, he had completed his dissertation and he had done all of that. But then he had to take the comprehensive written test. And he flunked it. He was in Germany, a German university. And he said it just drove him to the floor because he wasn't that kind of person. And I doubt he ever failed much because he's extremely studious. He said, I found out later one reason was I was given some misinformation as to how to prepare for that, and I, I just didn't. But he said, I'm very thankful that in Ger at this German university, and he said, evidently it's all over Germany like that, they, they give you a second chance. Well, we went on back, because he already, already had one doctorate, and he was teaching in the university. And he went on back, and he, he said, two years later, I took that test. But he said, those two years between the time that I failed that test and the time I took it again, I was determined that I'd know all there was about that a human being could know, and I'd put forth the necessary effort to learn it, and he came through fine. Well, I think of people who can do that and want to do that, but think of the determination, the dedication that one must put forth to be able to do that. And with some, it's going to require more than others because we're all at different degrees of IQs and so forth, but... The thing that gets people through everything is being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in it. And that's true as we see from 1 Corinthians 15, 58 concerning our own faithful service to God. We never quit. We are assured the peace of God which passes understanding. Philippians 4 and verse 7. One of the things that completely overawed and astounded the pagan Roman mind and Greeks and others at that time because they didn't understand anything about Judaism and if you didn't understand that you had no knowledge of the one God but they certainly didn't understand about Christianity until the gospel came to them 
But one of the things that they saw was the suffering of the Christians. It didn't seem to stop them at all. It only caused their ranks to grow because this world was not their home. They were just passing through. Roman couldn't understand that. With him, when this life was over, that's it. He might believe in some sort of gods, but a lot of times he didn't. And you get all the gusto there is to get when you, in this life, get it. You don't otherwise. But here were a people who went through all sorts of misery. And a lot of it brought upon them because of what they believed and taught. But they didn't stop. Why? Because they had insights that the pagan couldn't have through the knowledge of the Word of God. They had the eye of faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. They could see their eternal home via the truth of God. And they trusted Jesus with the power to save them. And they didn't expect to find peace in this life independent of God's direction and the peace offered eternally when this life is over. So the Prince of Peace not only wants us to have inner peace, but he wants us to let that inner peace keep us on the right course. Foremost in his mission on earth, Christ came to give us that peace that only God can offer us. But it won't come if we don't really believe what the Bible says. And that belief is only a real active belief when we do what we say and know the Bible says. In Colossians 1.20 and also Romans 5.1, I put those verses together and read, Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Then we read, being therefore justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, justified by faith. That's not only one's individual belief that's correct based upon the Word of God, but it's the system of faith that is the New Testament system. Jesus has said, Lo, I'm with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Then he said in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, I will never leave you or forsake you. Brethren, think with me about this for a moment. I have preached it all my life. I believe it with all my heart. You have dear loved ones, husband, wife, parents, children. But when you come to the end of your way, whether you're at yourself or not, you'll have to walk across Jordan alone in the sense of other human beings. They can't go with you. They may be sitting by your deathbed holding your hand. They may be speaking to you. They may be bathing the fevered brow to do everything they think they can. But even they know that moment comes when they can't go with you. Well, think about what's being said right here. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Does that mean just in this life? Or does it mean when the time comes for the spirit to leave the body? Well, I firmly believe with all my heart it means that God cares for His children more than we even understand. And there's not many of them in this world. And among those that are here, even uh, fewer that are really faithful. And my Lord will lead me home. So for those who continue in sin, thus rejecting Christ and His way to save them through the gospel, their belief and obedience are the same. There can never be real genuine peace with God or for that matter within themselves. Again, Isaiah 57, 21, there is no peace for the wicked. But that's not the case with faithful children of God. He is our haven. He is our rest. And it doesn't stop when this life on earth comes to an end. The wicked have no anchor to be able to stand all the buffeting that comes from Satan and living life on earth of the flesh. Trouble is sure. Trials are certain. But God gives us great assurance that we may have strong encouragement who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us which we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure 
and steadfast. Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. Why is that in your Bible? And what am I to understand and you're to understand when you read it as a child of God? It means that the hope that saves us is designed to help us realize, I said this morning, even this will pass away no matter how terrible it is it's come upon us but heaven won't pass away it won't cause Jesus to go back on his word he will be with us he will not forsake us he will guide us right on through the waters of death if you'd like to think of it that way Jesus died for us to become our sacrifice for sin listen to this Blessed be God who beget us again into a living hope. Now, that's what we're really talking about. He made us alive. He beget us again. He beget us again into a living hope. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead. Do you have any hope or expectation of being raised from the dead? Well, if you do, and it's a proper one, it comes because you know what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ being raised from the dead. And it says then he wasn't just raised to the dead like Lazarus to have to die again. It says of him, incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away. And then he returns to us. Well, that's who it's addressed to, reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4. Reserved in heaven for you. You ever buy reserved seats? I think probably we have. What does that say? Well, they're waiting for you. They're in your name, and nobody else can sit there. At least they're not supposed to. And if they do, now I've seen this happening in places where people accidentally get in the wrong seat and they have to move around and give you your seat. Well, think about that for a minute. As a member of the Lord's church, a child of God, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, there is a place in heaven reserved for you, and nobody can take it from you. You can give it up. You can apostatize. You can be overtaken in a trespass and not repent of it. But nobody can take it from you. The devil can't do it. It's waiting on you. It's there. So life will end on this earth for every one of us. But Paul put it this way to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. And we see that that is a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 again. The point being this, when he talks about this earthly tabernacle, the Greek word skene, it means a tent. You don't permanently live in tents. And that's what he's saying about the body we presently live in. It's a tent. It serves its purpose for our life here on earth. What God intended to be done here in searching for God and finding Him and being faithful to Him. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to return to the dust from whence it came. But what about the body we're going to receive because Christ was raised from the dead and we're faithful to His calling? Well, He makes it clear it's a house not made with hands. It's not made with human hands. God has created that great resurrected body. That'll be the abode we remain in forever. So when problems arise, and they will and they have, the wicked are like the troubled sea. But not so with the faithful child of God, the genuine Christian. We have a hope, an anchor of the soul. And in the midst of all the problems that are always in this world, Paul wrote, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, Philippians 1.23. Something wrong if we don't try to develop our love of God and faith in God, that we don't have that yearning, having the, the desire to depart and be with Christ. In Romans 8 and verse 18, Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. And later in that same chapter, Romans 8, that was verse 18, in verse 37, he said, Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 
We just don't stop as his children and realize the power of God that works on our behalf. The power of the gospel and the word of God to get us through life and to take us into glory. Indeed, the wicked are as the troubled sea, and they always will be. There can never be rest, not true rest, and peace for any who reject the will of God and steer their own course or courses through this life. But Christ is our peace, Ephesians 2.14. He's our plea. He's our mainstay. Our eyes are fixed upon Him through the truth of God's Word and the Gospel system. And we will not take it off. He offers us safety. He offers us eternal rest, John 14, 1 through 3, and so many other places in the New Testament. It's up to us to heed His Word, to take them to heart, to meditate on them, to see in our lives what needs to be done and undone. And thus he still says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. And thus we can only come to the conclusion that Paul came to in writing to the Philippian brethren, Philippians four thirteen. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I guess we can conclude this by simply saying. The troubled sea of the wicked cannot really harm the follower of Jesus Christ. So when you see all this going on around you, it's going to keep on. It will ebb and flow, sometimes be a little better, sometimes worse. It may not touch you personally, but it will touch you personally sometimes, or directly or it may indirectly, but you're in the middle of it. What keeps you going with the marvelous words of life? Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. We sing sometimes. Those words are written because of such a thought as we have here concerning the happiness and the peace of mind that Christians have because they're faithful to God. Now this will help every one of us love each other more as brothers and sisters make us more determined to abide in the truth of God's will, more determined to try to reach the wicked as they're being tossed to and fro in the sea with the truth of God that can save them. It'll refresh you, it'll raise you up, it'll keep you going. And there's not anything else that will. If you need to obey the gospel, we would urge you to do so this afternoon. To become a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church that Jesus built and purchased with his blood. You need to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with the Lord in baptism to attain the remission of past sins. The Lord will add you to the church, and therein you can walk by His direction, setting your thoughts on things above and not on things on the earth. As a child of God, if you've wandered away from that, you haven't paid attention to the compass, and you've got yourself caught up in things, repent of them, recognize them for what they are, error, they're not leading you the right direction. Turn from them in repentance, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. And thus we offer this word of encouragement and this song based upon the message we've heard and also what all the rest you know to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ and do so now while we stand and while we sing.